Okay, it's just afternoon. So welcome everybody to the Innovative Leadership Series. My name is Matthew Klein. I'm a lecturer here at Clemson University in the MBA program. Um, with us today, we're very fortunate to have Josh Frazier, the CEO and founder of Origin Protocol. Um, Origin Protocol brings peer-to-peer -peer commerce and decentralized finance to the masses. Josh started out coding at the age of 10 and co-founded three venture-backed companies prior to launching Origin Protocol. EventView, Torbit, which was acquired by Walmart Labs and Forage. Uh, Origin Protocol is a blockchain platform for building decentralized marketplaces, which are more resilient and promote open and free commerce. Origin ensures lower fees by enabling buyers and sellers to securely meet and transact without middlemen and ensures everyone can own a stake in the network by contributing to its growth. Moreover, it provides the opportunity for 2 billion unbanked people to access new markets globally. For me, having missed uh, the NFT craze and NBA top shots, and then having just done a number of transactions through Airbnb and everything for the holidays, I'm excited to hear uh, what Josh has to say about the blockchain, crypto, and more importantly, his work at Origin Protocol. So please welcome Josh, and thank you for being here for the Innovative Leadership Series. And just for clarity's sake, if you could, please put your questions into the chat, and then I'll stop Josh as it goes, or we can wait to the end, all right? So thank you, everyone. Josh, I'll let you take it away. Oh, thanks so much. It's an honor to be here today. Uh, I graduated from Clemson in 2006. Uh, always, uh, you know, I had the absolute best time uh, at Clemson. Uh, and so it's really fun getting to come back and, and hang out with you guys today. Uh, and today is actually a, a really special time for us. Uh, right now, actually, like as I'm speaking, we just got listed on Coinbase. Um, which is, is just a, a huge milestone for us. Um, it just went live at, at 9 a.m. Uh, with our token ODN uh, that, that's now available in the U.S. So uh, super, uh, super exciting time for us, and, and I'm super happy to uh, get to spend this with you. Uh, I want to make this interactive, so please you know, jump in, ask questions. Um, let's have more of a conversation um, versus any, anything super formal here. Um, I, I just want to tell like my story uh, about how I how I got into the space, and then um, maybe I can share some of the lessons I've learned along the way. So I grew up in in Scotland. Uh, my dad is Scottish, my mom's American, and we moved to the states when I was fourteen. Uh, I went to uh, high school and then went to Clemson, studied computer science. Um, but really, I started playing with computers when I was when I was really young, uh, at the age of ten. So just playing around with writing software and programs and uh, coded all the way through high school and, and college. Uh, and I remember my freshman year, I came into Clemson and I, I wanted to uh, study mechanical engineering because I, I thought that if I made computer science, if I studied computer science, that it would ruin my hobby. And I remember my advisor uh, who, who I just you know, happened to meet, he was a computer science professor. And he said, are you stupid? He said, most people go over whole lives hating what they do. And you found something that you love. And if you do something you love, you'll never work a day in your life. And so he was like, hey, I just signed you up for some computer science classes. Uh, and, um, there I was signed up for computer science 101. I took it, I, I absolutely loved uh, my time in that class and it immediately, you know, switch my major uh, and never look back. Uh, so, and after graduating from Clemson, uh, I started a, a company with my roommate from Clemson, uh, and we started just doing a, a consulting business. Um, quickly after that, uh, we heard about this program in Boulder, Colorado called TechStars. And TechStars, uh, as some of you may know, is an incubator model where we give you uh, a little bit of money and lots of advice and connections and mentors and really help you learn how to start a business. And so with that, um, right out of Clemson, moved to Colorado uh, and started uh, working on um, this company called EventView, which was trying to help people meet uh, and network at conferences. Uh, so we were able to raise some funding for that business, ran it for three years, and then ultimately shut down. And what I learned from that experience is that, um, you know, you're, it, it, <laughs> I learned a lot from that experience, but you're, you're gonna work really, really hard 
on any business. And so you might as well work on stuff that it has a chance at a really big outcome. And I didn't really understand that going in, but it wasn't that big of an opportunity that we were going after. And um, we worked our asses off every single day. And when I realized that at the end of it, it was like, uh, you might as well go after like the biggest, craziest, most audacious idea you can. Because the guy at the, the restaurant down the street is, is working just as hard as you are as an entrepreneur. But the payout for him is, is way smaller than what he could have if he uh, had, um, you know, if he was working in technology or going after a bigger market, a bigger opportunity. The other lesson I learned was just the importance of building something that people really need. Um, how do you build something that's really a painkiller and not just a vitamin? You need to find something that's really solving uh, a really serious pain point. So after that, that business shut down, uh, I learned a, another lesson and that is that failure is a part of a process and it's not a permanent title. And so I went back to all of the investors who had given me money and I said, hey, sorry, I lost all your money. Can, can I have some more please? And to my surprise, we all said yes. And so I started a second company, which is Torbit. Uh, we were doing performance optimization software, helping web websites load faster, uh, built that that business up over the next couple of years, and then ultimately sold that to Walmart Labs. And after that, I took some time off, went and saw the world, did some, did some traveling, and I came back, started my third business, which was uh, Forage, uh, which is a food delivery company uh, similar to Plated or Blue Apron. Uh, and we would put all the ingredients you need uh, to make dinner in a box, and we'd ship it to you. And um, ran that for uh, a, a couple of years, and realized that the, my co-founders and I had slightly different visions for how we wanted to grow that business. I was a lot more obsessed with growth and getting it, blowing it up as big as we possibly could, as fast as we possibly could. Uh, and, and, and my co-founders were more interested in uh, you know, the experience and, and growing slowly. Uh, and so it was a little bit of, with, at odds with the venture capital model that um, we had raised money from. So after that, I uh, quit doing the venture-backed companies for a little bit. Uh, and at that point, I met my co-founder, Matt. Uh, and Matt was, uh, you know, just uh, one of the, the best things that could have happened to me was meeting, meeting him. Uh, Warren Buffett wouldn't be where he is today without Charlie Munger. And I, I wouldn't be where I am today without uh, my co-founder, Matt Liu. Uh, we instantly hit it off, uh, started building some cash flow businesses together. And uh, they were, you know, we were very fortunate that very quickly uh, they started taking off. So we built uh, an affiliate marketing company in like first month we were on a million dollar runway. Uh, and then we, we had this automated machine that would just spit out cash and we said, let's go build something else. Uh, and so we built this uh, service called Price Slash. We'd, you know, we'd ha run a call center and had whole crew of people who would call and, and negotiate your bills for you. Uh, and then after that, uh, we started playing around with the blockchain. Uh, and I'd gotten into Bitcoin in 2010, believe it or not. I uh, read about the, the Bitcoin white paper uh, on, I think it was probably dig.com or maybe Hacker News. And uh, read the white paper and just captured my imagination. I thought this is, this is really cool. Um, but at that point, there was, there was not a single, there was no Coinbase, there was no exchange, there wasn't a price for Bitcoin. It was just this thing that you had. Um, and there were even like websites where you could just click a button and it would send you free Bitcoin, like they called Bitcoin faucets. Uh, and so I, I remember turning on my laptop, downloading the software, mining my first block of Bitcoin, so 50 Bitcoin, uh, which is worth quite a lot today. Uh, and then after, you know, you could do that. And I think it took like six, seven hours, something like that. Uh, and then I turned it off because it was making my computer run slow and it's getting really hot. And so I turned it off. Uh, and, and forgot about, went back to doing real work. Um, thankfully came back in, in 2017 and uh, I was like, where is that, where is that laptop? Um, found it and thankfully uh, it still booted up and, and was able to, to recover those, those Bitcoin. Um, but then for my, Matt, my, my co-founder today, uh, kept telling me, check out Ethereum, check out Ethereum. Uh, and so I put her off for a long time, well, longer than it should have. Uh, and, but when I finally sat down and read the white paper and really understood what this technology meant and what it, what it enabled, um, I was all in. 
right? Right then and there, I was like, I don't know what we're going to build. I don't know what we're going to do, but this is the once in a lifetime type uh, innovation and technology, technological leap that enables a whole new type, a new class of computer science problems that we've never been able to solve before, particularly in the realm of trustless computing. And so we sat around, we, we wrote down uh, all of the different ideas we had for what we could build in the blockchain space. Um, we, from trading tools to, uh, uh, to, to different ideas um, for uh, companies we could build or, or protocols we could build in this space. And then we circled the biggest and most audacious idea on the board. And that was, what if we could build a, a marketplace uh, that would completely disintermediate um, the buyers and the sellers and there wouldn't be a middle, get rid of a middleman altogether and allow buyers and sellers to connect and transact directly on the blockchain. And so that's where we started. We set out to, to build just that uh, and we built it. We built uh, a, a protocol on the blockchain um, for uh, buying and selling anything. Uh, and so that's where we started. Uh, we pitched it as a, a way to disintermediate Uber and Airbnb um, or displace Amazon uh, on, um, you know, on uh, and, and this sort of future way of, of being able to, to, to buy and sell. Uh, and so we went out and were able to raise uh, significant funding. So we very quickly brought in $38 million of funding from our investors um, all over the world. And one of the, the coolest things about what we're building is that it's a completely decentralized network. It's not a traditional company in the sense that uh, we don't have central headquarters where you know, our headquarters are on the internet. All of code we write is open source. We have 180 open source developers that have contributed to our code base. Our community is over a million people strong all over the world. Uh, and so one of the what cool things about the space is just the strength of the community and that whole community aspect of what we're building. So as we set out to build Origin, what we found is that building a two-sided marketplace is really fucking hard. And uh, it's really hard to get uh, one side of a marketplace, let alone both sides of marketplace. And it's really hard to build Uber, let alone Uber plus Airbnb plus Shopify plus everything else. Uh, and, and all of you probably knew that up front uh, and, and wouldn't have been dumb enough to try it, but, but we, were, uh, we, we had the audacity to, to go after it. Uh, like I said, you're gonna work just as hard on the small ideas as the big ones. So you might as well give it a shot and go for the biggest, craziest, most audacious idea that you can. Uh, but after, after sort of banging our heads against the wall for a while, trying to get actual usage of our platform, we decided to narrow the scope a bit. And we said, okay, let's focus on just one side of a marketplace at a time. Let's go after Shopify. Let's build um, storefronts for people who already have customers. And then that way we can just serve them with our platform. And so we built that, we called it DShop. And it's a decentralized shop, uh, Shopify, Shopify competitor. Uh, and you can run a store, there's no fees. You don't, and, and it's completely decentralized, runs on decentralized tech. And that means that no one can tell you what you can and cannot do on this platform. Uh, unfortunately, the, the use cases for that type of, of marketplace are still quite limited. Uh, there aren't a whole lot of things that are um, banned from Shopify. Um, and most of the categories that are spanned, you know, things like uh, heroin and cocaine and stuff like that, uh, we're not particularly keen of, of going after uh, as US citizens who don't want to spend our lives in jail. And so we found ourselves in this position where we had this uh, really interesting technology, but there wasn't a whole lot of, of demand for it. And so we started looking around of what, you know, what can we build? Where are the biggest opportunities? And we kept coming back over and over again to things that had done best for us were things that were native to crypto. Uh, and we've been paying a lot of attention to what was happening in the world of decentralized finance. And so if you're not familiar with it, first you've got, you have Bitcoin, then you have Ethereum, which allows for programmatic computing, but also allows for programmatic money. And so you can actually have computer code that actually 
dictates when and where your money goes, how it moves, and it allows you to programmatically control uh, the flow of funds. And this allows you to displace a lot of the things that we have in traditional finance. You can build things like lending protocols where you can borrow money from a protocol, except there's no bank, there's no paperwork, there's no one you have to talk to. You just talk to the protocol, you put in your collateral, and then you take out a loan and you can take out a multi-million dollar loan in 15 seconds without having to talk to anyone. You can build things like Uniswap, which is a decentralized version of Binance or Coinbase, where you can swap from one currency to another uh, without, again, without a middleman, without an intermediary. Uh, it's like the exchange desk at the airport where we'll give you euros for dollars, except anyone who wants to can just jump behind the desk, put up their capital and start making money on the, the trading fees uh, as they're exchanging the money between the different customers. On top of that, we're seeing comp these companies are actually creating their own tokens and giving their tokens away as rewards to the people who are using their protocols. And on top, so as like just as a user of these protocols, uh, you can you can benefit greatly uh, just as as a user uh, of them. Uniswap, for example, gave away four hundred Uni tokens, which I think today are worth twelve thousand dollars if if you actually hung on to them. They gave them to every user who'd even once just played with their protocol. And so we looked at this and we said, there's got to be something interesting we can do in this space of DeFi. Uh, and so we launched a, a new product called Origin Dollar, uh, and it's or OUSD, and it's a new kind of stable coin. Uh, and backing up a little bit, one of the things we also noticed is that more value is transferred today over Tether than on Bitcoin. And that's because there's a lot of issues with uh, using Bitcoin or other volatile currencies, because even especially in, in commerce or trading, one side or the other is always getting screwed. I don't know if the price is going up or going down, but it's not going to be what it is today. And so stable coins are digital dollars um, that are, are transferred on the blockchain. And so you have this, you, know, you have all of the upside of digital currencies are open 24-7. There's no wire transfer fees. You don't have to talk to anyone, but it's instantly global. You can send money between the United States and Australia or Iran or wherever you want. And it's very simple and easy and inexpensive and, and to do that. And so what we said, what we, we decided to do with Origin Dollar was take all of these protocols, lending protocols, trading protocols, and then bundle them up in, in the form of a stable coin. Uh, called Origin Dollar. So you can buy Origin Dollar today. It's, it's worth a dollar. It's always worth a dollar, uh, but it earns a, a, a generous yield, usually at least 20% APY a year. Uh, sometimes I think currently it's been much more like 35% uh, APY. Uh, and that is from the fees that are generated because behind the scenes, your money is being lent out on uh, trading platforms, lending platforms. And as that interest in the yield comes back in, you, you have additional units of origin dollar which show up in your wallet. So you can think of it a little bit like a high interest savings account. Um, and um, all you have to do is buy and hold it and your money will grow in your wallet. Uh, and isn't that what we all want? We, we want to have our money put at work. We want to have it freely available to spend, but we also want it to be earning interest and in, in making money for us at the same time. So we launched that product uh, and then <laughs> horrible, horrible thing happened. Uh, we got hacked and we had the, the $7 million that we had uh, in Origin Dollar got, got hacked uh, by, by attackers. This was December of last year, our token price crashed um, and it was, it was a really rough time for our business. Uh, but we were, we were lucky in that we, were, um, we, we raised a lot of funding. We we're in a very good place financially. And we made the hard business decision, the most expensive business decision I made up to that point was we said, we're just gonna make everyone whole. We're just gonna, the $7 million that was stolen by hackers, we're gonna pay it out uh, from a company treasury. We're gonna make everyone whole. Uh, and so we did that. Uh, and simultaneously, we'd been working on this new product called uh, the NFT Launchpad, uh, which, uh, we it actually didn't have a name. We said, let's just build it on top of uh, D-Shop. 
Uh, and let's, let's try and do something in this whole new world of NFTs. And NFTs were still just starting to get, pick up steam. Uh, and so we, um, we started playing around with this. We said, let's, let's just see what we can do uh, with NFTs. And so we worked with one of our friends, Justin, a DJ, and uh, he's been a friend of ours for a long time. And we said, let's just try and, and run a sale uh, on this platform. And so we built this, uh, this storefront where you can buy NFTs. And, and for those of you, I'm sure most of you have heard about them at this point, but you can think of NFTs as just digital collectibles that are logged on the blockchain. Uh, and so we ran a sale for, for Justin um, and we brought in $11.7 million uh, for him on this platform. It exceeded all of our expectations, exceeded his expectations. Uh, and instantly uh, got the attention of uh, the entire music industry because what he did is he took uh, one of his albums and he actually tokenized each song on his album and sold it as an NFT. And no one had ever done this before. Uh, and so when we did this, it, it just got the attention of the entire music industry. Uh, and so for about the past month or so, uh, we found ourselves at the epicenter of this whole new craze around NFTs. Uh, and so we've been uh, turning this into a new product where uh, people are able to uh, buy NFTs uh, on our platform, or you can run your own NFT sale. Uh, and we're finding the largest artists from music uh, and entertainment, uh, as well as fine arts and other, other categories as well, are, are really interested in this whole idea of selling NFTs uh, and being able to create digital versions uh, of these, these things, these collectibles. And it makes a lot of sense. Um, the world is shifting more and more digital. We're shifting into a world where we want to, we, we, we've always wanted to collect things. Uh, as humans, we, we have this natural desire to, to buy things, to collect things, and to show off with our friends. We buy houses, we buy cars, we buy handbags, stuff that we can, we can show off and flex. But what happens when your best friend lives on the other side of the world and you know the person and on the other side of the world better than you know your own next door neighbor? When, what about when your life becomes more and more digital and more and more of the interactions you're having are, having are happening in a digital context? Well, the obvious uh, thing to do is start buying and collecting things in a digital world. And that's, that's really what we're seeing with this whole craze into NFTs is that people are just wanting to collect things and, and connect directly with artists in this new way that wasn't possible before. Uh, and so just over the last few weeks, we've been inundated with interest from the entire music industry, with, um, as well as other categories as well. Uh, we just announced our, our upcoming drop with Lupe Fiasco. We're gonna be selling some, some NFTs uh, for him on, uh, on his website, nft lupefiasco.com and then Jake Paul the boxer uh, is actually going to be uh, doing a drop as well uh, nft.jakepaul.com uh, he's going to be doing it with his fight so he's going to be uh, ha having a fight live on pay-per-view and then as the fight is finishing he's going to be uh, selling some nfts on the origin platform uh, and so that, that brings us to where we are today we're uh, launching on coinbase uh, as we speak and uh and uh, super, super excited about that. Um, yeah, and so anyway, that's, that's my, my, my story, my journey. Um, I wanna just kind of open it up for some questions and, and make it more of a, a conversation from here. Yeah, this is great, Josh. Uh, first question here comes from William Stratford. Um, congratulations on the Coinbase listing. Is BlockFly, Bitstamp, or other exchanges forthcoming for your coins? So we're actually, Coinbase is one of the later exchanges to list us. Uh, we've been listed on Binance and Hobi and a lot of Asian exchanges uh, like Upbed and Coin One. Uh, we've been on some of the apps like Crypto.com and, and uh, Blockchain.com for a while. Um, so we're, we're probably listed on a couple dozen exchanges at this point. Uh, but the U.S. is a little bit more conservative uh, at trying to figure out what what are these tokens, how do they fit with securities laws, uh, and so there's a, a lot more sort of red tape that you have to fight through. Uh, to be able to get on uh, an, a prestigious exchange like Coinbase. 
Um, and so we're, we're really thrilled to, to finally be able to do this after, you know, three or four years of, of running this company. Okay. William had another question here about the transferring of money to Iran and other, you know, countries. Sure. Um, you know, what's really enticing the government to do so, or what kind of steps are you taking to, you know, was it BSA and AML and Patriot Act compliance and those types of things? The reason I say this, and I think William has a great question is, you know, there's a local company in Greenville, I don't know if you've heard about it, called ShipChain. And they did an initial coin offering and the SEC said, nope, nope, nope. Uh, yeah. That's 60 million you raised, wrong, right? That yeah. was actually a financial regulation. So how do you, how do you, regu how do you handle all this kind of stuff or know your customer type work? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I, I think, you know, the interesting thing is that uh, code is just speech. It's just words. I could, I could stand up here and just read out the source code that powers uh, origin. I, I, and that I think all of you would agree that's just speech. I could read out some letters and numbers which represent a transaction to send you money. I could, I could just verbally tell you 0x129 whatever, and, and you could write it down, type it into the computer, and you could actually literally receive money from me. And so what we have is free speech is very much protected under US law. But at the same time, we have these financial controls which say what you can and can't do. And so free speech and, and financial controls are, are very much on a collision path towards each other because free speech says you, you absolutely have a right to do this. Code is just speech and speech is protected. And, and by the way, code is now money, right? Because we have a blockchain and we have um, digital money. It's just code. Um, but we also have these traditional uh, rules around who you can send money to, how you can do it. And really one of the, um, you know, one of the, the concepts behind blockchain technology is personal freedom, liberty, um, the ability to choose for yourself who you want to send money to, how you want to transact. Uh, and yeah. so- yeah, yeah, stop there. So, you know, two days ago in the Wall Street Journal, I don't know if you saw this, I'm sure you might've, but China just released its first digital yuan as a currency. Mm -hmm. And how do you see central banks influencing either good or bad, the blockchain and Bitcoin and all these types of um, you know, tokens and stakes and whatnot? Because obviously they wanna be able to see every transaction themselves, but one of the value propositions behind these coins is the anonymity of them. So what do you think is gonna happen with this tug and pull, if you will? And I put the article for everyone in the, uh, in the chat so you guys can see it about the, the rise of this new digital currency in China? Yeah, the, the question is always, who do you want to trust? Uh, on, US, on US dollars, we're saying, God, we trust. But really, you're trusting the, the US government, right? You're really making a bet on uh, the United States of America and the government and everything that it represents, that they're not going to devalue your money, which they're doing, by the way, they're printing it like crazy, and, and it's becoming more and more worthless by the minute. Um, or you can say, I, I want to trust math. I want to trust economic incentives. And that, that's really the, the promise of, of Bitcoin and crypto is you don't have to trust anyone. You don't have to trust banks. Uh, you don't have to trust uh, government. And, and so when you think about um, you know, putting your money into a bank, you don't actually own that. They can actually seize it at, at any time. If you look through the terms and conditions, they can take it. The government can take it. You don't actually control or, or own that money. You also don't have any control or, or really power over the supply of it. There's nothing stopping the Federal Reserve from just printing boatloads of more money and devaluing the money that you have. And so, yes, I think governments are, are very threatened by this because um, cryptocurrency is, is a threat to the control and the power that the governments have um, because uh, is putting the power back in the hands of the individual to choose uh, where we want to spend their money, how we want to uh, how we want to invest it. Um, so I think we'll see you know governments continue to explore um, how they can play in a space. A lot of it is good uh, in the sense that like our, our our finance system needs to be upgraded. It, it's insane to me that um, I you know I, I, I you know want to send money to a friend and I have to use you know, a, a traditional wire transfer. And it's like, oh, you can't do this, it's a Saturday. Yeah, you have to wait till Monday. 
why? Right? It's 2021. Like we have the internet. Like why? Right? Oh, it's a thirty dollar wire charge. Why? Right? Like hey, I send an ACH transaction to someone. It takes three days to settle. Why we we <laughs> we have the internet, right? So a lot of this stuff needs to be updated. We need to bring it into a digital world, um, and in some cases where you know it's okay to that we trust companies. I think it's very natural for uh, us as humans. We develop strong trust and affinity for different brands. We trust uh, Google. We trust Apple. We tr we like Clemson, right? We these brands that we really relate to and, and trust, uh, and and that's okay. Um, but it is, it's a different type of thing than what we have with blockchain. We don't have to trust anyone. You know exactly what you're buying into and you're not you know, putting your trust in, in the government. You're not putting your trust into a company um, that may go back on their word or, or change your mind about what you can or cannot do. Yeah, I can't agree more on the, the time wasted, you know, like clearing a check seven to nine business days if it's large. It's like, why? <laughs> so your point here, um, Josh had a question on, can you talk about the difference between the OGN token and the OUSD token? Are their technical independents pretty much the same? And it's just the, the, the parties that are mixed or how does that all play out? Sure, so Origin Dollar is a stable coin. It's worth a dollar. Uh, it will always be worth a dollar, except that it grows, right? You get more dollars in your wallet over time. Um, Origin Dollar is a, or OGN is a speculative asset. Um, it's currently worth about three dollars, which billion dollar uh, billion tokens puts us a network value of three billion dollars on uh, network value uh, for OGN. Um, and, and what that is is really taking a bet on the future value of the Origin network. Um, the actual utility of a token is is designed around uh, the governance of of Origin dollar. So we have. Uh, since the hack, we've since recovered. People are putting the money back in. We've, we've conducted uh, multiple audits to make sure that it's secure uh, and taking multiple measures to, um, to, to really make sure that it's a, a safe place to, to park your money. Uh, and we feel very confident in, in security right now. Uh, and so what you can do um, with that is there's this huge pile of money that is being held in origin dollars right now. Uh, and um, there has to be some someone who decides how that money gets allocated. But we don't want, we as Origin, the company, we don't want that responsibility of deciding. We want to give that power to the token holders, the people holding OGN. And so by holding OGN, you can actually have a voice in the, the direction, the governance of uh, this new protocol. And so it allows you to actually own a stake in this network that we're creating. Uh, and then we actually take a, a percentage of the yield that's generated from Origin Dollar, and then we're actually buying back OGN on the open market um, to power some of the other programs that we're, we're doing. So there's a, a really interesting uh, financial model there where you can actually participate in the future success of the network that we're creating. Great, right, Josh, thank you. You know, one of the concerns that I always hear all the time, and especially given the rise of Bitcoin in price, I even have neighbors setting up their own little mini mining rigs, right? So <laughs> in their garages, you know, as it's cooler, you know, as those things get hot fast, as you know, from your laptop back in the day. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> uh, what are your thoughts concerning the climate impact of mining? And do you think regulation or calls to cease mining may have an effect on your business? Uh, well, well, good luck. Uh, try and trying to stop it, right? You can't, you can't, uh, stopping it means, you know, turn, turning off the internet, which I don't think anyone's, Really willing to do. Now, I, I think one of the things that people don't realize is that um, capitalism largely takes care of its problem. Um, usually, what happens is the power plants have to be near cities um, where they need to be where the people live. Um, but the beauty of mining is that you don't, it doesn't need to be near anything, it'd be out in the middle of nowhere. Um, and so there's all of these actual natural power resources that are nowhere near people. Um, but, our, you know, you have huge waterfalls, you have um, large fields with lots of sunlight, you have all of these green energy sources that are being completely untapped right now, uh, and, but, but are perfect for crypto mining. And so that's actually what we're seeing is a lot, you know, the, the largest sources of mining are actually coming from these areas where it's, it's green. Why? Not because anyone's coming at it from a perspective of, hey, we want to save the planet. Because it's cheaper, 
it makes financial sense for them to go there. And guess what? It's not taking away from, it's not, it's not hurting the planet in any way. They're using renewable energy by and large to, to do this mining. And so I think we're going to see more of that um, where it just makes sense to go to these, these remote areas. Um, most of the mining that's happening today is already happening that way uh, with green energy because it's cheaper uh, and financial incentives really take care of this problem. Uh, it, people get, you know, really upset and he did talking about this, you know, you're destroying the planet. Um, and when you actually dig into it, it's, it's just not the case. You also have to think about what Origin's trying to do with the disintermediation between like the Airbnbs, the VRBOs of the world. They have their own set of servers, right? So, and that, that takes up a lot of power as well. So it's kind of an off balancing uh, situation because Carlos had a question here about, you know, who is cryptocurrency competing against? Is it currency stocks, treasury bonds, Western Union, MoneyGram, whoever it may be. But I think to your point, it really depends on the application of what it's being used for. And that's where origin comes in. Like, for instance, you know, I just booked a couple of places at Airbnbs and VRBOs. And if, if you're like me, you want to go find the owner first instead of having to pay the service fee. So if you do enough yeah. Googling, you can pretty much figure out who owns the house and go direct. And that's kind of what the approach you're trying to take with origin. So to answer this question, correct me if I'm wrong, but the point of the crypto or the point of the blockchain is to really disintermediate other things that are already occurring in a way that drives two people or two transactions together, correct? And that's where you guys did that brainstorming effort, correct? Yeah, so I think there's, there's, there's multiple different facets to it here. Uh, you have things like Bitcoin, which are squarely focused on being a, a better form, uh, a better store of value. Think of it as digital gold, where you're taking uh, your wealth and you're saying, I don't, I don't want to be holding my money in dollars because the Federal Reserve is printing it like crazy and it's devaluing it every minute that I'm holding it. Uh, whereas in, with Bitcoin, there's only 21 million Bitcoin. A lot of them have been lost. We've, we've already mined most of them now. And the supply is diminishing. Every, uh, every year we're getting less and less uh, Bitcoin that are being distributed um, by the miner, to the miners. And so that's largely what is driving up the, you know, that, that you know, supply is diminishing and, and demand is increasing. Uh, and so as a, as, as a store of value, I, I can't think of a, a better place to, to park your money. But then we have Ethereum, which is saying we could actually do trustless computing. This is a, a decentralized ledger, which is, uh, stored in tens of thousands of computers around the world, we can track more in this ledger than just the balances of who owns how, how much money. We can actually track the internal state of a computer. And so that allows us to unlock a whole new class of problems that have never been solvable before in human history. Uh, you, can, you can actually build, today you can build a decentralized marketplace that would replace Uber or replace Airbnb. Now, you still have a lot of challenges in how you actually get the buyers and the sellers to get there and how you, um, how you, have, you know, re replicate all of the trust systems that you have and, and those sorts of systems. But technically it's possible in a way that's never been, been done before. Uh, and as far as actual currencies, you know, Bitcoin's not, not actually that great as an actual currency. Uh, people are using Tether a lot more than they're using Bitcoin uh, because it's stable, right? They don't want something that's, that's quite that volatile. The gas fees are really expensive. And so um, it doesn't make sense to go in and buy a cup of coffee with this. But for anything that's important, for anything where uh, it, it is really, really important, Bitcoin, Ethereum, digital currencies, these are, these are absolutely superior uh, ways to, to move money around. Um, for the first time in history, you can, you can cross borders with billions of dollars just in your head. You can just memorize the password, walk across the border, and you don't have to worry about the risk of anyone seizing it from you or, or taking it away from you, asking questions about where you got it or where you're going or what you want to do with it. Uh, and so that's that, you know, at least for me as a libertarian, that, that's, that's really, really cool. So, you know, back to your kind of story, you, you did get hit by a little cyber attack here and had some situations you to uncover, right? So, and Jay has this question, Jay Patel is, you know, what happens if there's another massive attack that, you know, basically disrupts Bitcoin or Ethereum, loses its value, or maybe it's deleted off the blockchain? I mean, part of the whole blockchain is that I have a copy, you have a copy, but how does all this kind of play out, if you will? Yeah. So I think, you know, for, for Bitcoin, uh, you know, it was created in 2009. 
uh, and no one's no one's been able to, to attack it yet, right? We've seen lots of attacks on the periphery, lots of centralized exchanges going down, lots of uh, phishing attacks, lots of you know wallets getting attacked, but the actual core protocol itself has never never gone down. Uh, same is true for Ethereum, right? We haven't we've seen attacks on the on the periphery, but the actual core protocol protocol has never been been attacked. And so I think as time, more time and more money is goes through the system, you actually can end up with more, more and more bulletproof systems where you can actually trust and count on it more and more and more. And so, you know, taking Origin Dollar as an example, we, we took this huge punch in the gut <laughs> with this attack, but then we came back stronger than ever, right? And so now, you know, we have more confidence and our investors have more confidence that this is actually something they can trust because, we, we learned our lesson from it, right? We, we made it that much more secure. We did more audits, we did more testing, we did more, um, it, we added insurance protocols, we did a bunch of stuff to, to make it um, more safe and make sure this would never happen again. And so um, I think where we end up is it's very, very hard to secure these smart contracts. But once you get there, once you get to that point where it's secure, you have these building blocks we can start stacking on top of each other we can create new types of financial instruments where these protocols can actually start interacting and, and actually trading with each other, having agreement. Protocols can have uh, relationships or agreements with other protocols, and, and it creates this whole new uh, class of things we've never been able to do before. Austin, thank you. So another question along those lines, and I think it kind of dovetails to what you're talking about with the security being enhanced over time. Recently, large publicly traded companies such as MicroStrategy and Tesla have taken essentially all of their treasury cash or a good portion of it and put it into Bitcoin. Uh, help me understand that for the group and why do you think they're doing that and does it help validate what it is you're trying to do? Why would they go for that type of volatility? Because obviously I this went up dramatically when the SEC filings were released. They're, they're buying it because they're, they're smart and it's a superior asset. The, the problem with holding dollars is they're getting devalued or, or over time. So if you're sitting on a pile of cash, it's becoming more and more worthless uh, as the Federal Reserve is pumping out more and more cash. All of those stimulus checks that everyone just got, guess, guess where that money came from? We just printed it, right? And so uh, it, might, it might feel good in the moment. Why do you think the stock market is seemingly up so much? Is it because it, the economy is really booming that much? Is it really doing that well? No, it's not. Have you looked around? Like, every, like people are suffering, people are struggling all over the place. What's actually happening is we're just printing this money and just stuffing it into stocks and equities and stimulus checks and, and, and uh, funding more uh, military complex. But the actual dollars themselves are actually becoming more and more devalued. And I think it, in fl wild inflation is, is inevitable. It's very hard for us to escape at this point. And so what I think these companies are, are doing is they're realizing that you know, if you're holding a bunch, of, a bunch of wealth, you want to do it, you want to hold it in some assets that are actually going to appreciate in value, that are actually going to or at least hold their value. And so you could think about gold, right? That gold is what people have used for uh, centuries. This has been the way you store your value. Except gold is like really inconvenient. It's really heavy. It's bulky. It's hard to store. It's hard to secure. It's hard to you know buy a cup of coffee with. It's hard to cut it up and, and do it. It's hard to send to people, right? If I want to send it across the world, and so Bitcoin is a, is a, a better form of gold in, in in every way. You've got the same scarcity story around. This is something that is, is scarce. It's hard to hard to create, um, and it's actually more predictable than gold. Right, gold. There's miners out there, and we, you know, and if the price of gold goes up, we're going to mine faster, right? We're going to, you know, hire people to start digging on the weekends, and supply is going to continue going up. Maybe we'll find a new pool of gold somewhere, uh, and and we'll have this unexpected spike in supply of gold. You don't have that kind of problem with Bitcoin. You know exactly what it's going to be, um, and it's backed and secured one by math. <laughs> two, by economic incentives of the miners and people holding it, and three, by the community of people all over the world who actually believe in it. Uh, and that's actually what you're, what you're buying into, is this, this concept that um, you know, is not dependent on the whims of, of one country or who's president or who's the chairman of Federal Reserve. You're actually betting on 
you know, millions of people all over the world um, continuing to act in their selfish best interest. And as long as they do that, Bitcoin is going to do just fine. Thank you, Josh. You know, it's funny that you talk about that because, you know, given Janet Yellen's statement of having a global tax on corporations, it's kind of interesting how these things are all kind of playing together. You're not in the U.S. right now, correct? Is that? Is that... I'm, I'm actually in Taiwan. Uh, so I was in San Francisco. I spent the last decade in San Francisco. Uh, and then uh, the lockdown uh, in, in San Francisco just really grated on me. I, I you know, I, I couldn't take it uh, much longer. Um, and, and meanwhile, I was reading on the news on how Taiwan has just done a phenomenal job at combating uh, the coronavirus. Uh, they actually have like zero cases uh, here in the country. Uh, and so I applied for the visa, got accepted, and I've been here since October uh, of last year. Um, and it's, it, it's kind of remarkable. I mean, every, every country in the world was given the same challenge at the same time. We all knew the same information about coronavirus at the same time. And some countries aced the test and, and some failed miserably. Um, and, and Taiwan is, is one of the few that, that absolutely aced the test. Um, we've never shut down, everything's open. It's, it's a, a really fun place to, to be right now. I know, it, early morning there, correct? Uh, it's about uh, almost 1 a.m. Okay, so <laughs> thank you for joining us. Yeah, of uh, course. The, the other question I have is around, you know, cultural adoption, right? You know, we're in Greenville, South Carolina. I know friends out in San Francisco are kind of hot on the crypto scene. Where's the rest of the world in comparison to, you know, Appalachia, for lack of a better term? How are we, are we far behind and people aren't really catching up or are we really just missing the boat and it's okay? I, I mean, I think it's up to the individual. Um, you know, there's, there's plenty of people in, in South Carolina who are, you know, we actually have engineer, uh, an engineer in, in, in South Carolina who works for Origin uh, today. Uh, someone, I, I, a friend from high school who I have the privilege of working with um, many years later. Um, so it's really up to the individual. I think one of the most remarkable things about blockchain is that it's, it's not tied to any one country. When we look at our Google Analytics to say, where is our community, where are these people from? The map is just green. It's the entire world that is covered. We have people, but our community is, is all over the world. Um, and so it's, it's completely changed the way I think about running a business from you know, the companies I've run in the past, where we had headquarters in one city, we focused on the US market, and very focused on, on just that, everyone in one office. Uh, and today it's, uh, we, you know, we have 20 employees uh, and we're, we're all over the world. Um, we have people in Europe, we have people across the United States, we have people in, in uh, Singapore, here in Taiwan, Australia, uh, all over, all over the globe. Yeah, including the uh, contributors of, you know, on the GitHub and whatnot. Yeah, it's all amazing. So, you know, this industry does have a, a stigma tied to it with the ethics and things like that. So I'm going to ask Sarah's question here. You know, the average person doesn't carry that much money across the border. You know, obviously governments want to have those steps to add regulation, reduce illicit behavior. As big tech evolves, what do you see as the responsibility to stop that behavior? And can you as this you know, platform, if you will. How do you keep the illegal activity out of crypto? <laughs> so the people have been using this, uh, uh, th this question, you know, to, to attack Bitcoin from the very beginning. Oh, it's only gonna be used for drugs or, or illegal activities. Um, most, most drug dealers actually use cash. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's the dirtiest money out there. Uh, and honestly, like all money is dirty, right? There's, but it's just a matter of how many degrees back do you need to go uh, every dollar bill in your wallet has traces of cocaine on it, um, as, and it's probably been, you know, um, you know, in, in places we won't talk about, right? So uh, all, all money is dirty. It, it really just comes down to, um, you know, who who controls that money, right? And who gets to say how you can spend it or or how you can. Uh, and for, you know, we we have this new technology, uh, and it's it's, un, it's unstoppable. If if one government decides to ban it or shut it down and try and regulate it, they're only hurting themselves. That, that you can't put the genie back in a bottle. Other countries are gonna embrace it. Anyone who tries to ban it is just gonna get left behind because this is the, the native currency of the internet and you can't stop it anymore when you can, you can shut down the internet at this point. So with that being said, the other question I had for you is, let's talk about you know, asset allocation as an individual. 
you know, Warren <laughs> is famous in one of his investor reports that basically spelled out to his trustees that he wants 90% of the assets in the S&P 500 and 10% in short-term government bonds. Set it, forget it, and never look at it again. That's his advice to the trustee. And yeah. millions of people have taken him up on that through Vanguard and other platforms, right? Sure. What he, about he, he called Bitcoin. So you got to tell, before you answer the question, you got to tell me, if you had to percentage size your asset classes, where are you sitting right now? Like, where would, where would you go? What advice would you give the next generation in terms of <laughs> Buffett? So, 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 yeah, I mean, Warren Buffett called uh, Bitcoin rat poison squared. Uh, and he was wrong, right? He, he, the, the data just says he, he was wrong. Uh, retail investors were, were right on this one. Um, uh, massive respect for, for Warren Buffett and, and Charlie Warren. Uh, I've learned a lot from these guys. But, um, you know, I, I, I'm an extreme case. Uh, I, I'm almost exclusively in crypto at this point. Uh, most of my net worth is in OGN, as you can imagine. Um, I also have a lot of money in uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum uh, and a laughable amount of money in my Bank of America account where I, I actually have to make sure I don't overdraw my account um, <laughs> because sometimes I, I forget to, to, keep, to keep enough cash in there. So I, I wouldn't say I'm like typical by, by any means. Um, I, I will sort of challenge traditional wisdom though. I think traditional wisdom says uh, it should, it's all about diversification. You should go into mostly into very, um, very safe, quote unquote, safe type assets. Most of your money should be there. I mean, you have a tiny little percentage that's focused on high risk stuff or maybe a little bit that's on medium risk. Um, but the main thing is like diversification, have lots of different things. Never put your eggs in one basket. And the alt alternative approach is put all your eggs in one basket but then spend 100% of your time every day focused on that one basket and making sure that nothing goes wrong, that you're actually you know, doing everything you can to uh, you know, make that successful. Um, and that's, that's the best way to grow your wealth. It's not the best way to protect your wealth. And so I think early in your career, you should be focusing on how are you going to grow your wealth and then later on in your career, you, you sort of change your mindset a little bit to how are you going to protect it? Uh, and the most important thing is, how, you know, how do you grow your wealth? And this is something I think everyone cares about. How, how, do you, how, do you, how do you become rich? And you become rich by owning things. Uh, and so the most important thing is you're owning assets that are actually going to appreciate in value. Um, and it's staying away from stuff that, that isn't going to appreciate in value. So owning equities, owning cryptocurrencies, owning properties, um, owning things that are actually going to appreciate value, staying away from dollars, dollars, are, <laughs> cash is trash, stay away from that. But, you know, equities is, are fine. Crypto is even better. Um, you know, if you want to be in more traditional, safer stuff of assets, um, real estate, knock yourself out, you, you can do that as, as well. Um, but, but, you know, I, I think people are overly concerned about, um, people play too, too safe. Uh, in you like especially early in your career you should take more risks um why not right uh it's it's usually uh things are not really as risky as, as they appear this is great i love it this is so much fun <laughs> so you know a lot of these folks are graduating got mba in entrepreneurship and data analytics that kind of thing what and you had some great advice in the beginning about you know going big on the market and some great advice here about kind of pushing to the outliers to the edge in the beginning. Any other final thoughts you can give this group as they kind of go out in the world with their newly minted degrees? I think the, the biggest advice I can give people is always think about how you can have leverage and what you do. Um, all of us are constrained by the same, we're all, by default, we're all constrained to 1X, which is we're all stuck at 24 hours in the day seven days a week and we got to spend a lot of our life sleeping. And so how do you actually break free of that one X that, that we're all trapped in? And the way you do that is with leverage. You can get leverage in multiple ways. Uh, if you're an engineer, you can get leverage by learning how to code and you can write software with a laptop and you can reach billions of people just, just by typing in a computer. You get leverage by hiring people and growing a team 
now instead of it just being you, there can be 20 people who are, who are all working towards the, the goal that you have. And for people with big dreams, even if you're, you know, aren't, don't find yourself as a good manager, this is, this is your only choice. This is the only way for you to go after these big audacious ideas is to, to find other people who are gonna join you on that journey, who are going to uh, help you uh, achieve those goals. If you're in finance, capital is one of the best ways that you can actually get leverage by investing in other companies and other ideas and other people and ideas that you wanna see in the world. Uh, and so um, always be thinking about how you can break free of being tied to the clock. Instead, not just putting in the hours, how are you actually gonna get free where you can actually get that leverage and you can have this enormous impact, an outsized impact for, for what you're doing. And you know, look at, look at what we did with Origin. We've got a free billion dollar network and 20 employees. Whatever companies in the world have that, that kind of ratio. Um, and, and so look for those opportunities in your life where you can get that, that unbounded leverage. Incredible lessons. Thank you so much, Josh. I don't know if you're gonna just keep going since it's 1 a.m. or go to bed, but either way. We appreciate you joining us and look forward to having you back at Clemson when it makes sense. So I'll keep in touch. Thanks again. Have a great day. Please do. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Uh, and really everyone else, you guys head off to their classes and residency weekend. Thanks again.